Good morning, New Point. How are we doing? Ah, we're finally getting that weather that we desire in Ohio. But it'll probably change tomorrow, all right? But let me tell you one thing that'll never change. And that is God's love for you. Prayer does more than what you think. Because God does more than what you can see. And so whatever you're praying for, keep believing. Because God is doing more than what you can see. He's a good God. He's a great God. He's a generous God. And guess what? He's in love with you. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And so we celebrate that every Sunday. First day of the week. This is not the weekend. This is the first day of the week. And the reason why we come and we gather on the first day of the week is to remind us of how great and how good and how generous God is. So that we can go into that week full of faith and hope and encouragement. And so I just want to give a shout out to all of our campuses. Those of you in Canton and Worcester, Millersburg, Coshocton, Cambridge, and those in T County, Dover and Philly. You know, I love you. More importantly, God loves you. We're in this series called The Relationship Survival Guide, The Field Guide to the Art of Living with People. And here's why we're talking about this. If you are a Christ follower, you should do relationships better than anybody else. Y'all okay on that one? Christ followers should do relationships better than anyone else. There's a lot of other things that we may not be good at, but one thing that we should be good at is relationships. Loving our spouse, loving our kids, loving our moms and dads, loving one another. And people should be asking you and me, how do you do it, man? How do you make marriage work? How do you do family life? Because of Christ. Now, I realize, though, that relationships are not always easy. They're challenging. They're difficult. Why? Because everybody has an opinion. And most of us do not keep it to ourselves. Would you agree with me? We express it. And yet what I want you to understand, and this is why we should do relationships so well, is because relationships are at the foundation of God's nature. And since we are created in his image, and he is a relational God, we should be great at relationships because they're the foundation of who you and I are. There's nothing more important than relationships, absolutely nothing. You see, without relationships, without attachment to God and others, we can't be our true self. I can't be Dwight. You can't be who God created you to be. We can't be truly human. And so if we are to thrive, if we are to flourish, if we are to grow, if we are to experience this abundant life, we got to have healthy relationships. And it's all rooted in love. It's love that fuels this transformation, that gives me and you the ability to love other people who are different than us, who look different than us, who think different than us. You see, we're, my wife Patty is just in the process of planting flowers. Maybe you are too. You would never think of taking a flower and shaking the dirt off and placing it in an empty box in the garage, would you? You would say, it has no roots has no soil. It's no way that it's going to bloom. It's no way that it's going to flourish. And so it is with our relationships. If it's not rooted in love, the love of God, God's love for us and our love for one another, then what happens is it will not flourish. It will not grow. It will not bring forth what we desire. And we can't do that in isolation. We can't do that all by ourselves. That's why we would say at New Point, doing life alone is dangerous. That's why we need one another, because we were created for relationships. And our emotional and psychological well-being depends on us relating with one another in a healthy, loving, biblical way. And the status of your heart, the status of my heart, depends upon my connection with God and my connection with other people. I'm made to live in community. And that's why we have to build these skills. We have to be intentional. 
and the better skilled you're at, or you're, you are at relating to other people, the better you're going to be at life and the greater quality of life you're going to experience. And so that's why we encourage you to be a part of a group. The first group that you're a part of is your family. But then you need to expand that. And you need to be able to get with some other people who may think a little bit different than you, who may act a little bit different than you, who may even believe a little bit different than you. And that's all to develop you so that you can become the best version of who God created you to be. But what's the key? What's the difference maker in all of this? I, I love this quote by William James. Whenever you're in conflict with someone, there is always one factor that can make the difference between damaging your relationship and deepening it. That factor is attitude. Attitude. And you say, Dwight, what is an attitude? An attitude is this. It's an inward feeling expressed by an outward action. You know, you cop an attitude, right? And what happens is there's just something inside of you. I got to express this. I got to let them know how I'm feeling. And what happens is that inward feeling gets expressed in outward action. And healthy people understand that a right attitude sets the right environment, the right atmosphere for that relationship to grow and to develop and to flourish. It has been said that nothing can stop a person who has a right attitude. That's the one thing that you and I get to choose. You always get to choose your attitude. You, you don't always get to choose your circumstances. You don't always get to choose the people that you're with. But you always get to choose your attitude. And our attitude determines our approach to life. Your attitude does. It determines our approach to our relationships. It determines our approach to failure and success. It determines the outcome of everything and anything in your life. You get this one thing, attitude. You see, here's what I believe. Life is 10% what happens to me, but 90% on how I respond. And our attitude can turn problems into blessings. Our attitude can turn a negative situation into a, a positive situation. And so you have this one opportunity, and I have this one opportunity. And if we're going to learn the art of living with people, especially people who are different than you and me, we have to realize this difference maker, and that is attitude. It's the greatest contributor to the health and the development of relationships. You say, Dwight, I got a relationship that's not going well. It's not good. It's not healthy. Then change your attitude. Change your attitude and see what happens. You'll never build great relationships as long as you indulge in bad attitudes. You just won't. You'll never have a great marriage. You'll never have a great family. You'll never have a great workplace. You won't have a great life. And so this is all rooted in love, in love. And we've been looking at 1 Corinthians. And here's what it says. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Check this out. It is not proud and it is not rude. We've got a lot of rudeness going on today, don't we? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's so easy for people to flip people off. People are cussing who never have cussed before in their life. People are blowing up that have never blown up before in their life. And it all goes back to this attitude. And what we have to do is we have to look to the one who mastered it. His name is Jesus. We believe that Jesus makes life better and he makes us better at life. And so Paul says it like this. In your relationships, Dwight, with Patty and Caleb and your family and your coworkers and, and, and your neighborhood, have the same mindset, have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Wow. Why? Because he did it best. He modeled the way. We have an example to follow. And so the two things that are required for you and I to grow and to develop in our relationships is to have the right attitude and to get the right principles. And I want to share with you some principles this morning, okay, that will make a difference if you and I will choose the right attitude. Let's dive in, all right? Here's the first thing. Selfishness destroys relationships. Would you agree with me there? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
most bad attitudes. When, when Dwight has a bad attitude, you say, Dwight, you ever have a bad attitude? I do. Pray for me, okay? Because it's tough, isn't it? But my bad attitudes are rooted in selfishness. It's my own selfishness. And selfishness destroys relationships. It destroys marriages. It destroys everything. And so we have to understand that. James, the brother of, of Jesus, he nailed it, all right? He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. Oh, my. And somebody's going to pay for it. Somebody's going to pay for it. James goes on and he says this, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and every what? Evil practice. And so it's easy for selfishness to trip you and I up and to destroy relationships. L -l Listen, if you're having marital problems, I can help you. You don't even need to go to the counselor. Quit being selfish because it's destroying your relationships. And relationships take intentionality. They take work. They're hard. And it's human nature for us to be selfish. That's why it's so hard. You don't have to learn this trait. It comes natural to each and every one of us. So we have to be able to identify it. I never realized how selfish I was till I got married. Then we had kids, and then it really turned up in another notch. And, and so it just comes natural to me. And I would say it comes natural to you, but here's what we need to understand, and it's this right here. Selflessness builds relationships. Selflessness builds relationship. When Dwight says no to him and he says yes to his, his, his wife, Patty, or his kids, or the co-workers, it's unbelievable. And, and, and selfishness, selflessness means that you don't remember all of your good deeds. You remember all of their good deeds. So you don't keep a track of all the times that you said no to you and you said yes to them. You keep track of all the times that they said yes to you. And when you do that, what happens is you begin to live a selfless life. And you celebrate the fact that you love them, they love you, and that you're in this relationship. And so we need to be able to deal with our selfishness. We need to be able to be intentional in being selfless. I love what, what Paul says in Galatians. He says, the person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God harvests a crop of weeds, and he'll have to show for his life, all he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of what? Real life, eternal life, a quality of life. And so here's the first principle. Selfishness destroys relationships. Selflessness Builds them. Let me give you the second one. And here's the second one that, that we need to look at. Pride destroys relationships. Would you agree with me? Pride will destroy relationships. Look at what Solomon says in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride will destroy a person. A proud attitude leads to what? Ruin. And pride is so self-deceiving, isn't it? It's so easy to see in other people, and yet it's so hard to see in ourselves. Everybody can see it in you except for you. And that's why it's so dangerous. And what does pride look like in a relationship? It's where you and I always offer advice and correction, but never ask for advice and correction. So let me ask you a question. When's the last time you asked your spouse, honey? How could I do this better for you? <laughs> or do we have the attitude, you should just be thankful that I'm trying. See, what happens is it's hard for us to admit that we struggle with pride. It's hard for us to admit that we, we need help. It's hard for us to admit that we have difficulties. And pride will do you in every single time. It's the mother hen of all other sins. And so here's what we need to realize, all right? Humility builds them. Pride destroys relationships. Humility builds them. And whatever relationship you find yourself struggling in today, okay, if you will 
take on the form of humility, I promise you, you will see a change almost immediately. Because humility is a relationship builder. And you say, what is humility? It's honoring people above yourself. It's thinking about the other person. Paul says it this way in Philippians, be humble and give more honor to others than yourselves. Your attitude should be the same of that of Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not demand pride or cling to his rights, pride as God. And so the question becomes, how do you and I begin to exhibit humility in our relationships? With our spouse, with our kids, with our mom, with our dad, with our co-workers, serve them. Serve them. That was the attitude of Jesus. Jesus said, I came not to be served, that's pride, but I came to serve other people. And I promise you, this is the key to better relationships. You want a better relationship? Deal with your pride and put on humility. How about this third one? And that is this, insecurity destroys relationships. Wow. Insecurity destroys relationships. It ruins relationships. Why? Because, listen to me, okay? You can't be insecure and experience intimacy at the same time. Insecurity prevents you from intimacy. See, the fact of the matter is we all want to be known, right? But many of us, we're afraid of being known. You can't get close to somebody in a relationship if you have fear in that relationship. And that fear usually comes from a sense of, of insecurity. Because you want to be known, but you're afraid that if you are known, they'll reject you. By the way, that's why living together doesn't work. Okay, because you, you'll never know when somebody's going to walk. And what happens is you need a relationship of where you know that you're committed to one another through thick and thin, no matter what, so that what happens is you can be open, you can be vulnerable, you can be truthful, and you don't have to live in that, that area of insecurity. And insecurity damages and destroys relationship. Because you can't get close to somebody if there's fear in that relationship. That's what happened with, 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 with um, Adam. Adam got fearful, and so he hid. That's why Solomon says it like this. The fear of human opinion disables. See, if, if, if you're afraid of your husband, you're afraid of your wife, you're afraid of your mom, you're afraid of your dad... Vice versa, what happens is you'll never be able to get close because you will never let those people know you because you will be living in the fear of rejection. And when you are so insecure that all you think about is what other people think about you, it destroys the relationship. It hinders the relationship. So let me ask you a question. What do you fear in your relationships? What causes you to fear? As I mentioned, this is the oldest in all of our relationships because Adam said it. I, I, Genesis records it. Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. I was vulnerable. And so I hid. And so insecurity, insecurity destroys relationships. And so we have to work on this. When you are afraid, you get insecure and you hide who you are. You cover up. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about emotionally. And what happens is you end up building walls around yourself. And so nobody ever knows you. I've heard people say this. I thought I knew my husband, but I guess I never knew him. I thought I knew my wife, but I guess I never knew him, her. And so what happens is insecurity destroys relationships. But here's what we need to realize. Love builds them. Love builds them. Love is the key. It's the foundation. John tells us like this. He says, love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it shows that his love has not been perfected in us. 
And so insecurities destroy relationships. Love builds them. Love takes the focus off of you and puts the focus on the other person. That's one of the best things that Patty and I have going for us is we're, we're open. We're vulnerable. She knows my fears. She knows my hurts. She knows my tendencies. I tell her. And so what happens is we're knitted together, not just physically. That's not enough. We're knitted together emotionally. We're knitted together spiritually. Because we haven't only gone there physically. We've, listen to me, we've gone there emotionally. We've gone there spiritually. And that's what brings the oneness. You see, you say, how do you do that? Well, let's look at what John says. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in him. God is love, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid. So I, I, I know the one who knows me best, and he loves me. And so that's where my security comes. I find acceptance. I find approval. I, I find significance in him. And as I develop that, as I grow that, then what happens is it spills over to my relationships with other people. So I can be honest with people. I can truly be Dwight. And the only way that that happens is when I not only know God loves me, but I experience it in my heart. And then what happens is you find out you don't have to prove yourself to other people. You can be you. Because of Jesus Christ. And so insecurity destroys relationships. Love builds them. Now we talked about this one here a few weeks ago. And that is this. Expectations destroy relationships. Wow. Right? Expectations destroy relationships. And you and I have to understand the difference between expectations and hopes and responsibilities. That is so, so, so important. And yet what happens is we come into relationships, whether it's marriage, whether it's friendships, whether it's workplaces, and we have these expectations. And expectations usually, okay, yield indebtedness. If I expect something of you, then you owe me something. And this destroys relationships. And we've learned, listen, we've learned that if you're a Christ follower, if you know that God loves you and that he'll take care of you, then we should have no expectations of one another. And that will help you to have a healthy relationship. You say, Dwight, how do you do that? Paul says it in Colossians. He says, set your mind on things what? Above, not on earthly things. What are earthly things? It's you and me. You see, you're broken, I'm broken. We're all broken. And that's why Paul says, set your mind on things above. Who's that? That's Christ. He will love you perfectly. He will love you consistently, constantly. And so what happens is when we expect, okay, people to be God in our life, they will always disappoint us. And so what we need to do is we need to expect God to be God, and we need to expect people to be people. Love does not grow in an atmosphere of expectation. Because if you, if you, if you fulfill my expectations, then you know what? You just did your job. You just did your job. So why should I thank you? Why should I be grateful? You've just done your job. And so expectations destroy relationships. Gratitude builds them. Gratitude builds them. You see, if I don't have expectations, if I go home today and Patty has a meal fixed for me, okay, and, and I don't have that expectation, then you know what happens? Here's what I say. Wow. Thank you. I'm so honored that you would fix lunch for us Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. See, that's why we're not very grateful because the things that people are doing for us, we just, well, that's your job, honey. Aren't you the wife? And I'm the husband. And isn't your job to fix meals and wash clothes and clean the house and whatever? And so what happens is we don't express gratitude to that which we already expect. 
But if we don't have any expectations, I promise you, then your gratitude will go high. That's why Paul says it like this. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Hey, Mason, you know what? In every circumstance, in every situation, you need to be thankful. You need to be giving me gratitude. You need to be giving the people around you gratitude. Y'all okay? I mean, come on. I mean, why is there so much tension today in our world today and in our relationships and very little gratitude because we're living by expectations and that'll destroy relationships. Gratitude will build, you know, I am so thankful that you would do this for me. That's healthy. That's good. That'll build that relationship. So let me ask you a question. Who do you need to thank? Who have you been taking for granted in your life? And you just need to go to them today. It may be a spouse. It may be a parent. It may be, hey, mom and dad, I just want to thank you for allowing me to live here. Hello. <laughs> okay, dial 911 afterwards, but, you know. Because what happens is we live by expectations. We just say, hey, you know what? This is the role that you're supposed to fill. This is the role I'm supposed to fill. And so what happens is when we don't meet those expectations, we get angry. We get upset. Let me give you this last one, and that is this. Resentment destroys relationships. Resentment destroys relationships. And, and resentment is the perception that someone has treated you unfairly. They have done you wrong. And resentment is caused by unresolved hurt or unresolved pain. And, 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 and this is very hard. This is very difficult because we've all been hurt. We all have felt that we have been dealt um, the wrong hand. We've all felt that we have been treated unfairly. And so what happens is many times it's hard for us to express our feelings. And so what we do is we push them down and we allow these to fester in us. And what happens is resentment begins to build. It begins to, to set in. And so what happens is, let me give you some characteristics of a resentful person. They don't have much empathy. They withdraw emotionally. They have the feeling of disgust or disappointment in a person. They ignore. What happens is whatever you say, it just doesn't matter to them. It's like talk to the hand. And that's what resentment does. And what we have to understand is there's no relationships that are perfect. So you say, have you hurt Patty? I have. Has she hurt you? She has. Have I hurt my kids? You know, somebody asked me um, a while back, we, we were, I was visiting the campuses, and I said, hey, fire any questions that you, you have at me, you can ask. And somebody said, what's your greatest regret? And I said, I wish I would have been a better parent. Y'all okay? I said, as I look back over my life, there's, there's, there's things I wish I would have done a little bit different. And, and, and so what happens is I've had to ask my kids to forgive me because I don't want resentment on their part in my life because we fail one another. And I realize that I want to do everything in my power not to allow resentment to grow up into their heart, into their life, because it'll destroy our relationship. It's just not good. And so resentment destroys relationships. But here's the key. Forgiveness, okay? Let's go to the next one, please. Forgiveness builds relationships. Forgiveness builds relationships. And, and, and so what God wants from you and what God wants from me is, is to be able to acknowledge that, you know what? Yeah, I have some resentment going on. I have some unresolved pain going on in my life. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to have an attitude of forgiveness. That doesn't mean that what they did didn't matter. Doesn't mean that what they did didn't hurt. Doesn't mean that what they did wasn't wrong. What happens is forgiveness is freeing you more than it's freeing them. And you're saying, you know what? I'm going to give you to God. 
I'm going to allow God to speak to you and to deal with you. And what happens is I know of no relationship that has any longevity at all that has not continually practiced forgiveness. Look at what Paul says in Colossians. He says, make allowance for each other's faults. Why? Because we're broken people, okay? And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive other people. Wow. Titus says it like this. He says, once our lives were full of resentment and envy, but then Christ saved us. Not because we were good enough to be saved, but because of his kindness and because of his love. By washing away our sins and giving us the new joy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. All because of what Jesus, our Savior, did for us so he could declare us good in his eyes. And so God would say, you know what, Dwight, I want you to do for others what I've done for you. And that is I have forgiven you. And because of that, we have a relationship. And he says, I'm asking you to forgive people in your life. And so what's the difference maker? It's attitude. It's selflessness. Okay? You want to be selfless. It's humility. It's love. Okay, it's, it's forgiveness. Those are all the qualities that we find in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why he's the best friend that you'll ever have. He's selfless. He's humble. He's loving. He's forgiving. He's all of those. And he says, Dwight, my relationship with you is what I want you to have with the people in your life. I want you to demonstrate these same qualities in other people. And see, Jesus didn't just say it verbally. He demonstrated it. He demonstrated selflessness and humi or humility. Let's go back, please. He, he demonstrated selflessness and humility and love and gratitude and forgiveness. And now you and I are called to have the same attitude, to have the same mindset that Christ Jesus had. We're going to celebrate communion. And communion is all about Jesus demonstrating these qualities directly towards you and directly towards me. And our campus pastors are going to come and they're going to lead us in this time. And as you thank God for his relationship with you, his friendship with you, I want you to be able to say to him, God, I need your power, I need your grace to be selfless, to be humble, to be loving, to be full of, of, of thanksgiving, and to forgive other people. And you know what he'll do? He'll fill you with the ability and the power to do that. And so our campus pastors are going to come, and they're going to lead us in this holy time. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you today for who you are. We thank you that we can say, what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. We thank you that you are that friend that loves us, that cares for us, that's intentional with us. And we thank you that you have that attitude towards us. And today, Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your life and your death and your resurrection, and how you've demonstrated these qualities in building a relationship with us. We pray by the power of your spirit that you would enable us and empower us to be able to demonstrate that towards our, our family, our spouses, our friends, our coworkers, so that they can see how we love you, how you love us, and how we love one another. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.